I'm privileged to be here with you this evening, this afternoon, to talk about this idea of economies and the plural communities and love, and this effort to renew the American dream from the ground up. The American dream of the rugged individualist pursuing his or her own individual prosperity and in that process making all of us better off. When that American dream first came to pass around 1776, we lived in what economist Herman Daly called empty world economics. There were about 750 million people worldwide at the time of the American Revolution. There was a lot of space on the planet. Now, we live in a world with nearly seven billion people, what Daly calls full world economics. And that has come about, that shift, of course because of growth in population, but also because of growth in consumption per capita. That combination of more people generally consuming more or much more has led to a number of issues and challenges that we face now, including the reality that just over the last century, the amount of productive land available to each of us, the amount of land per capita, has declined from about 14 acres of productive land to just over three and a half. And of course, one of the exemplars of that growth that we often hold up as a model is China. China, which has sustained growth through thick and thin and through everybody else's recession. And yet when we look at this, this little bar graph, looking at the blue bars here, that's what the world now consumes, all seven billion of us, in grain harvest, in oil, and in coal. The red bars represent what China alone will consume by 2030 if it continues at its current rate of growth. Two-thirds of the world's grain harvest and more oil and more coal than all of the world now put together. And of course, a lot of that growth in China ends up filling our big bucks franchises all over this country, Europe, and the world. And those big boxes are just one part of a larger phenomenon of increasing shopping opportunities, increasing amount of space. When I was a wee lad in 1960, there was about four square feet of retail space available per person in the United States. It's now grown to 38, a, a nearly tenfold increase. Now in rural areas, we have this natural wealth, our land and soil, our farmland, forests, waterways, and that represents natural capital. It's the foundation of our wealth. Unfortunately, historically, in Appalachia and in much of rural America, we have tended to overuse that natural wealth for instance, in clear-cut logging with a tremendous extraction rate, and at the same time undervalue those logs or those natural resources, that natural capital, when we cut it or harvest it and ship it out of the region where most of the economic value, 85 to 90 percent, accrues to other communities. There's a lot of other issues related to growth, what the economists would call externalities, very simply meaning costs, real tangible costs associated with producing a good, but they're not reflected in the price that you and I pay. And so if you happen to stop off for a sausage biscuit on the way to school or work, there's a very high probability, probably in the range of 95 percent, that the origin of that sausage biscuit came from hogs raised in conditions like this, where they literally cannot move, they cannot turn around. Those externalities extend to farmers and to farm workers. Lucas Benitez, a man I was privileged to meet about five years ago, a farm worker from the Immokalee region of Florida, where a very large proportion of our tomatoes are raised for those same fast food and franchise sandwiches as well as supermarkets. And learned from Lucas that the farm workers there are paid a penny per pound to pick those tomatoes in the Florida heat, which means when you've picked a ton, and I've picked a ton in a day on my farm, you're making $20. That's another example of an externality, that human welfare. And it isn't just the farmers and the farm workers. Our own health and well-being, in many senses, has become yet another externality. You can see from this graph that in 1960, we were spending about 17% of our average household income on our food, and only about 6% on health-related and health care expenditures. Now, those two lines have crossed and pretty much flipped where we're spending 16% on average on health-related expenses and only about 9.8% on food. And of course, the externalities associated with energy consumption. 
We see it most conspicuously in Appalachia from the coal industry, but you could make the same argument for virtually any energy industry in all parts of the world. Interestingly, oftentimes people will say, and this is certainly an issue in the coal fields right now, yeah, it may not be perfect, yeah, there may be some problems with the environment, but we've got to do it this way because of jobs. There's always that trade-off. And yet when you look at the numbers in the coal industry particularly, but in many, many commodity industries, the coal production has remained relatively stable, in fact has increased a little over the last half century while the jobs, the red line in that graph, have declined dramatically to less than 20% of what they once were over that same period of time. This growth model has certainly worked better for some of us than for others, and I would say that most of us privileged to be here in Blacksburg and in this auditorium are probably, generally speaking, the beneficiaries of this model of individualism and growth. And yet, even those of us who have benefited, those of us who've been part of a threefold increase in the size of the economy and a doubling in the average size of our homes and many of the other benefits of economic prosperity, we're not happier from that, generally speaking. The, the yearly studies of, of how citizens feel about it are showing a slow but steady, sort of inexorable decline in people's sense of contentment, of satisfaction and happiness, and a much more dramatic rise in problems of unhappiness and the psychological and emotional and fam family problems that accompany that. So if we're having all of this, and even those of us who are benefiting most from the system are at this point in, growth, in, in our contentment and our happiness, we have to ask the question, is there an alternative? And I often show this slide to remind myself that there is an alternative and that we must pursue that alternative. John Mullins was one of the first tobacco farmers to become a certified organic farmer in our region when we launched that initiative years ago. And this picture of him proudly holding Carolina Gold organic tomatoes he'd raised on his farm while smoking a cigarette says to me, we can do it. We can do it. We can make this shift. And so I'm going to suggest that moving forward to a more sustainable future and a renewed American dream is going to require, in my assessment, four basic transitions. And the first of those is this idea that we need to rebuild productive households and more self-reliant and resilient communities. Well, on farms throughout Virginia, Appalachia and much of the country, you see this intensification of agriculture, of sustainable farming in many respects, including the use of hoop houses and high tunnels and other things that increase the productivity in the season for farmers. We're seeing it in communities around the country that have taken abandoned primary schools or other old buildings like they've done here in Treadway, Tennessee, and converted it into a shared use commercial kitchen where people can both produce foods for the winter, canned goods for themselves, but also entrepreneurs can come in using local farm products and make many different products for sale at farmers markets. We see it also in the farmers markets that are emerging all around the country. Here in Blacksburg, I just walked through your wonderful new pavilion earlier this afternoon. This is Abingdon's farmers market. And what's so exciting about it is that just in the mid-90s, there were only about 1,500 farmers markets in the United States. And now USDA estimates well over 5,000 of these markets. And like Abingdon, with a diversity of shoppers coming there, well over a billion dollars in annual sales coming through these farmers markets. And very, very excitingly, particularly over the last few years, not just the well-to-do or the middle class, not just the foodie group, but in fact, more and more farmers markets offering for sale through use of wireless and other systems, allowing people to redeem their food stamps on an EBT card there and purchase directly from that. So you have lower income people and working folks also shopping at these markets. You have farmers teaming up with local food banks and churches and food pantries to either purchase or donate some of the excess produce and other products that they have to, again, help create a healthier food system for all people in the community. And it starts earlier than that. It starts in what has been called the outdoor classroom movement with school-based gardens, uh, compost piles, all kinds of things that get kids out of the classroom, 
getting their hands dirty, and beginning that process of feeling empowered to become a productive member of the community, something that just seems to have profound impact on young people, is so, so very basic to this idea. Well beyond the food system, into almost every dimension of our lives, we begin to see this effort emerge to be more resilient, to take care of ourselves more, including weatherization, insulation, and retrofitting of, of all kinds of buildings and homes to make them more efficient and to leak less energy and dollars. Now these resilient communities become a foundation and the second transition builds on this. And this is the idea that we need to unleash these local living economies based on needs, the needs of those communities, and on the place where they exist, the ecosystem of that place, the culture and the history of that place. We're beginning to see that because we've probably all grown somewhat tired of what David Corton calls the phantom wealth of Wall Street that idea where trillions and trillions of dollars were made and lost in a microsecond because really it wasn't wealth. It was financial transactions that were made at lightning speed and made certainly some people rich, but did they build wealth? Well, Corton says that's phantom wealth, and real wealth comes about in so many ways, like here at Virginia Tech, at Emory and Henry College, and in this example here in Ohio University, in Southeast Ohio, where Dining services are buying from local farmers. They're investing in their kitchens and in the people who work the kitchens to retrain them, but to then build the wealth of farmers by providing those markets. In Damascus, an old school scheduled for demolition was instead retrofitted. Geothermal heating and cooling system installed, new windows, and it has become a model of a wonderful place to live for low to moderate income seniors that is super energy efficient, creating jobs in this living economy and making them more resilient. In our area with nearly two thirds of our land in forests, it's so important to figure out how to use that living ecosystem into a living economy. Jennifer Wagner here in Meadowview, Virginia, stands proudly in her forest land, which has already had a sustainable harvest. The logs from which went to a local sawmill and a local millworks company and ended up providing beautiful hardwood flooring for the local public library as well as some homes in the area. That living economy idea is not only in the forest land and in the re retrofitting of old buildings, but on farms. Again, we've seen some examples of that, but here Mike and Rebecca Hubbard at their place in Tazewell County figuring out the systems of how they can make their land actually more productive with more animals per acre on that land and yes and at the same time far fewer purchased inputs a real model of sustainability and self-reliance farmers coming together in systems that are being called value chains where they aggregate their product together in community facilities like this one built by Appalachian Sustainable Development that allows very small farmers to get their products on the shelves of larger supermarkets as well as college and university dining service. And the reality that when you begin to create these local food systems you also create many opportunities for what Michael Schumann has called Lois economics, local ownership import substitution. One very small of many examples here is people in our region who've converted tobacco greenhouses to now raising certified organic transplants for these farmers who have embraced organic farming. Substituting instead of purchasing it from outside, creating that wealth locally. And that this living economy is attracting young entrepreneurs. One of the most exciting things about it, like this young fella just completing a, a solar roof installation in Kentucky, uh, this gentleman, a courier business, a zero carbon delivery and courier uh, business in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Will Clark, right in southwest Virginia, a fifth generation family farmer who with his dad has transitioned their farm to a model of a grass-based livestock farm that's highly sustainable, again with minimal inputs. And young people and their parents getting together to do the real work of restoration because indeed there is a lot of work to do in restoring our ecosystem. At Emory and Henry College, like tech, a strong commitment to sustainability and reducing their climate, um, climate uh, impacts has led to, among many other things, a focus on really increasing recycling. But really, to their credit, 
Emory and Henry did more than just put plastic bins all around campus. They contracted with a local entrepreneur who used sustainably harvested wood and produced about 35 of these beautiful recycling containers, which are now all around campus. So again, magnifying the impact. Rather than just purchasing something that was probably made in China out of plastic, a local economic opportunity comes from that. And all of these living economy enterprises that I'm giving you a few examples of need local investment from credit unions, from locally based banks, from community development finance institutions to reorient the dollars. And I would say not only from those financial institutions, but from you and I as, as both philanthropists and investors in these emerging local economy initiatives. So as we begin then to weave together these resilient communities with the local living economies, we come to this third transition. And this third transition is developing the networks that do this weaving, that make them stronger, that solidify them. Networks of learning, of innovation, and exchange. Some of those networks are happening very organically and naturally among local farmers who historically have been quite independent, quite autonomous, but are finding that when they sit down together, they can not only learn from each other or share orders to save some costs, but they can access markets like some that we've seen that they cannot get on their own. And those networks are not only happening at those local levels or here in Southwest Virginia, but they're emerging all around the country, these living economy networks. Uh, in Andersonville, Illinois, entrepreneurs have come together and the entire Chamber of Commerce of Andersonville is focused on local, locally owned businesses pursuing sustainability. This is just one of those businesses that is transforming Andersonville to this local economy. All the way on the other side of the country in Bellingham, Washington, a fantastic business alliance there, a local living economy alliance there has come together developed by local campaigns and have bringing the entrepreneurs together on a regular monthly basis to share ideas, to learn from one another, and to help get their community engaged so that they buy local first. These local living economy networks are part of a much broader national network that goes under the name BALI, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, weaving together these local networks into regional and national networks of learning, of innovation, and of support for this living economy. Very exciting movement. And so we, we're seeing the beginning of a return towards more self-reliant and resilient communities and households. We're seeing the, the emergence of of this living economy in food and farming, in energy systems, in green building and housing. And we're seeing these networks begin to develop as ways to enhance and support and accelerate that. But there's a fourth transition that I think is perhaps the trickiest one, but so absolutely essential. And this is the idea that we need a practice to practice a politics of love, beginning locally, beginning at the community level. Theologian Dallas Willard said simply this, the first act of love is always the giving of attention. And I want to use those quotes to frame this last transition that I think is so essential. We're in an amazing time right now, an amazing, exciting, opportunistic time, but a scary time. And think about the religiosity that has swept our nation and much of the world. And think about how sad it is that at the same time that we seem to be increasingly religious, there's more anger, more frustration, more pent-up violence, more exclusivity going on all around the world. And how can that be? How can those two coexist? Well, I think it's in part these two things. That first of all, we really have seen the world in these two polar extremes. We've seen it in the extreme of either capitalism or communism, and in our country at least, we choose the former over the latter. But along with that sense of those two polar extremes and nothing viable in between is this lack of attention that we're giving to one another to these emerging economies and these communities. This lack of attention allows us to generalize. It allows us to make abstractions out of one another. It allows us to put each other into categories and to marginalize new and exciting emerging kinds of economies. I'm going to suggest to you that love, as Wendell Berry said, can only happen in particularity. 
And that's the hard work and the exciting work that we all need to be about, is it's the practice of love which involves the skill of retooling our households and communities, of rebuilding these local economies, of linking them together into essentially an undeniable force of a new and better world. That's where I think we can go and we have to go. And so I'm going to close with one more reading from my dear mentor, Wendell Berry. A change of heart or of values without a practice is only another pointless luxury of a passively consumptive way of life. If people begin the effort to take back into their own power a significant portion of their economic responsibility, then their inevitable first discovery is that the environmental crisis is no such thing. It is not a crisis of our environs or surroundings. It is a crisis of our lives as individuals, as family members, as community members, and as citizens. We have an environmental crisis because we have consented to an economy in which by eating and drinking and working and resting and traveling and enjoying ourselves, we are destroying the natural God-given world. My suggestion to you is this is a time when we can turn that around, and this is a time when we can begin to rebuild and renew and refresh an American dream from the bottom up. Thank you.